This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In this holiday special, we're spending the hour with Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. I recently interviewed him before a live audience at the Free Library of Philadelphia. The date was November 28th, less than three weeks after Donald Trump's defeat of Hillary Clinton. Where were you on election night? Home. And talk about what you went through. Well, when the results came in from Indiana, um, I was very nervous. We had an outside chance with a conservative Democrat to win that seat. No one thought that Clinton was going to win it. And he got beaten rather badly, and I got started getting nervous. And it was uh, downhill uh, from there. Um, uh, I went into the evening uh, thinking that it was about a two to one shot that Clinton would win. So, I mean, I was, I was not shocked that Trump won. Uh, surprised, but not shocked for the reasons, some of the reasons that I gave. But I, I will not deny to you that it was a very depressing evening. I did not want to deal with the media. I didn't want to. I was invited to be on you know, a million different things. I didn't even show up at the state event, you know. Um, so I, I will not deny that it was a depressing evening. And uh, since then, I've been thinking as hard as I can with other people about how we go forward and what the best response is. This also catapults you um, into the position of the most powerful non-democratic Democrat <laughs> in the country. <laughs> Well, there aren't too many non-democratic Democrats who are in the United States Senate, so it doesn't say much. But yeah, it, um, but I think your point is that uh, last week or two weeks ago, uh, Chuck Schumer, who is now the uh, leader of the Democrats in the Senate, um, put me on leadership, and he gave me a position that I wanted, and that is to be chair of the outreach effort. And what I'm going to do is use that position, with your help, with all of your help, uh, to transform the Democratic Party. Um, I think <laughs> you know, it is very easy to beat up on people when they're down, and that's not my intention. You know, Secretary Clinton and her supporters are hurting now. It's not my intention to be beating up on them. But it goes well beyond the presidential race. Right now, in the United States, as you know, uh, Mr. Trump will be inaugurated. Right now, the Republicans control the U.S. Senate. Democrats had hoped. We thought we had a better than even chance of gaining control. We did not. We'll end up uh, with 49 seats. Uh, Democrats picked up a few seats in the House, but the Republicans will continue to control the House. Not only that, in about two-thirds of the states in this country, there are Republican governors. And in the last eight or so years, Democrats have lost some 900 legislative seats in state capitals all over this country. So I think any independent assessment, without casting any blame, says the current approach has failed. All right, when you lose, you know, it's like they always say about the football coach, you know, if you're zero and 10, you're not doing well. Well, the current approach clearly is not succeeding, and we need a new approach. And the new approach, I think, is to, A, create a 50-state strategy. That means we start playing ball in states that the Democrats have conceded decades ago. But more importantly, we create a kind of grassroots party where the most important people in the party are not just wealthy campaign contributors, but working people, young people, people in the middle class who are going to come in and going to start telling us what their needs are and give us some ideas as to how we go forward. And I accept this responsibility as outreach chair with a lot of uh, trepidation, but also with excitement. I'm going to be going around the country uh, to try to do everything that I can uh, to create a party which represents working people and not just the 1%. Mm. And the issue of who will head the, Democrat, the DNC? I am strongly supporting a congressman from Minnesota named Keith Ellison. And the reason I've known Keith for a number of years, Keith is the, uh, the chair, co-chair, along with Raul Rahalva, of the House Progressive Caucus, which is, by definition, the most progressive caucus uh, in the U.S. House. 
And Keith fundamentally believes, as I've indicated, that we need to make a major transformation of the Democratic Party. We need to make it into a grassroots party. And he has some very specific ideas as to how to do that. So I'm strongly supporting Keith. And I'll do everything I can to And the significance of his being the first Muslim Congress member at a time when the president-elect says he wants to set up a Muslim registry? Obviously, there is great symbolism in that. But to me, to be honest with you, as somebody who is not a great fan of identity politics, I'm supporting Keith because he is a strong progressive whose whole life has been about standing up for working families and the middle class and low-income families. But your point cannot be denied. And that is, it will be a statement to the entire country that the leader of the Democratic Party is a Muslim, that we want a party of diversity that we will not accept for one second the bigotry that Trump has been espousing during his campaign. What do you think Donald Trump represents? I, he, I mean, and who do you think he represents? That's a good question, and I don't know that I can give you a definitive answer, but this is what I think. Um, for a start, in terms of the campaign, uh, what he did is, as I indicated in my remarks, he touched the nerve, and it would be wrong to deny that. There are some people who think that everybody who voted for Donald Trump is a racist, a sexist, or a homophobe, or a xenophobe. I don't believe that. Are those people in his camp? Absolutely but it would be a tragic mistake to believe that everybody who voted for Donald Trump is a deplorable. They're not. These are people who are disgusted and they are angry at the establishment. And the Democratic Party has not been clear enough, in my view, about telling those people, whether they are white, whether they are black, Latino, Asian American, or whatever, women, gay, whatever, that we are on their side. And too often, what we look at is identity. You're a woman. Well, that's good. But we need more women in the political process. We need more African Americans in the political process, more Latinos. No question about that. But we need people who will have the guts to stand up to the billionaire class and corporate America and fight for working families. You were considered a fringe candidate. Maybe you yourself considered yourself a fringe candidate. When? did the moment come when you actually felt the burn? I'll tell you. <laughs> this is what I thought. You know, it's, and it's, you know, it's been a crazy two years. But you know, what I thought is, look, I wasn't born yesterday. And I, wasn't, you know, I didn't just get involved in politics two years ago. I've been representing the state of Vermont for 25 years in Congress. Uh, I was mayor of the city of Burlington for eight years where I took on Democrats and Republicans uh, to win a election. And I knew you know, that the message that we had, I could see it in Vermont. You go to the rural areas, by the way, where people are not necessarily pro-choice, where they may not be enthusiastic about gay marriage, where they may or may not believe that climate change is real, but they are sick and tired of having to work two or three jobs not being able to send their kids to college, worried about their own parents. I picked that up okay, in Vermont. And I thought that the message that resonated in Vermont, and I won uh, my last uh, election in Vermont four years ago with 71% of the vote. I did not believe for one minute that Vermont was any different than the rest of the country. But what ended up, to answer your question, what happened is, before I decided to run, and the book goes into it, we went around the country, and we did Honestly, you know, I, politicians always say, well, the people asked me to run, you know, after they'd already made up the decision to run. But, <laughs> but the truth is, I didn't know. I, how responsive would people be to our message? Well, I'll never forget, we were in on a beautiful uh, Sunday afternoon in Los Angeles. Maybe the weather is always beautiful there, I don't know. But anyway, was, <laughs> and I thought nobody would show up in a meeting. We had the musicians, Union Hall, we got 500 people coming out, run, Bernie, run. Uh, we were in Minneapolis. This is a funny story, which we relate in the book. 
uh, you know, we didn't know our way around Minneapolis, so we were driving around. Suddenly, we see this long line of people. And I comment to the guy next to me, I said, I wonder what concert is going on. <laughs> well, it turns out 7,000 people were there uh, for an event. This is early on. And what we were beginning to see with the turnouts, the turnouts at our rallies, more and more people coming out, more and more excitement, more working people, more young people, who indicated to me in a million different ways they were sick and tired of establishment politics and establishment economics. They wanted real change. And I will tell you, as the campaign progressed, that it was an awe-inspiring moment, a humbling moment, to be walking out on a stage, I think it was in Portland, Oregon, uh, where the trailblazers play in the NBA. And you look out, and there are 28,000 people at a rally in Portland, uh, 25,000 in Seattle, 27,000 uh, in Los Angeles. So people were starting to come out, the word was getting around, and it was especially gratifying to see so much beauty um, in, in the faces of young people who want real change in this country. And yet, <clears throat> who heard you were the people in that room, in each place, you were having the largest rallies of anyone, including Donald Trump, certainly far surpassing Hillary Clinton. Um, but what Donald Trump had that you didn't was the media. And, you know, that was repeated over and over by those that owned the media. You know, he's good for us. So it wasn't just Fox. It was all of the networks that were Trump right. TV. Right. He didn't have to travel. He was piped into everyone's Absolutely. home. March 15th, Super Tuesday 3, um, was a night when Rubio um, gave his speech and Ted Cruz gave his speech. Um, Clinton gave her speech and Donald Trump, they waited for half an hour for him to give his speech and showed the open podium, as they often did. They showed more of the open podium waiting for Donald Trump than ever playing your speeches. That's what, those were all the candidates that night. And they played all their full speeches. They did not play one word of your speech. You were speaking in Phoenix, Arizona, to the largest rally of any of those people that night. They didn't even speculate where you were. I wish I could disagree with you. <laughs> no, 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 Amy is raising a very, and, and we go into it in the book. I was stunned. I mean, you know, in the middle of the campaign, you're not, you know, figuring out this stuff or thinking about it. Turns out that from January 1st, 2015, I think through November 2015, ABC Evening News had us on for 20 seconds. What was 20. it you did that was so newsworthy? <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't much better on NBC or CBS. All right. it, and that's just the simple truth. And there are a couple of points. I, I think, uh, Amy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the guy who's head of CNN said, hey, Trump has been fantastic for us. I mean, literally said that. We're making uh, huge profits from Trump. And the point to be made is we had the misfortune of actually trying to talk about the problems facing America and providing real solutions. Trump was tweeting out about how ugly or horrible or disgusting or terrible his opponents were in really ugly terms. Perfect for the media. That is a great 12-second soundbite. But to talk about why the middle class is in decline or why we have massive levels of income and wealth inequality can't be done in 12 seconds. And second of all, it's not something that they are, frankly, terribly interested in. It was Les Moonves, who was head of CBS, who said it may not be good for America, but it's good for us. CBS? CBS. Yeah, I think C a guy in CNN said something similar. Because if you say outrageous things, this is what CNN lives for. That's what they live for. And then they got to have somebody else. Did you hear what he said? Oh, my God, it's terrible. And they go on and on. And that's, that is covered. Here is something. During the primary campaign, somebody... Uh, I think it was the Shorenstein School of Media at Harvard that were there. They studied the kind of coverage, and they said that uh, something like 90% of media coverage during the primary, and I don't think it got any better in, during the general, was all on this kind of stuff, gossip, 10% on issues. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. He's now in the Democratic leadership of the Senate, though he's an independent socialist. We'll return to our conversation with him after a short break. And I won't breathe a brace of air when I'm gone. And I can't even worry about my cares when I'm gone. 
Won't be asked to do my share when I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here And I won't be running from the rain when I'm gone And I can't even suffer from the pain when I'm gone Can't say who's to praise and who's to blame when I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here Won't see the golden of the sun when I'm gone And the evenings and the mornings will be one when I'm gone Can't be singing louder than the guns while I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here All my days won't be dances of delight when I'm gone And the sands will be shifting from my sight when I'm gone Can't add my name into the fight while I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. In this Democracy Now! special, we're spending the hour with Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. I interviewed him before a live audience at the Free Library of Philadelphia in late November. I asked him about the standoff at Standing Rock in North Dakota. I asked him about the Dakota Access Pipeline and why he supports the native water protectors who have led the resistance against the $3.8 billion project. Number one, we're dealing with uh, sovereignty rights for Native American people, an invasion of their own property, and violation of treaty rights, which is an endemic problem in this country. Uh, number two, you're talking about an area where if the pipe burst, water clean water that goes to millions of people in that region uh, could be severely impacted at a time when we're all concerned about the amount of clean water that we have. Uh, and thirdly, and most importantly, perhaps, you're talking about whether or not we should be in any way supporting a pipeline, which is piping in filthy oil at a time when we need to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy. So those are the three issues there. I think. Uh, what we have done is, number one, uh, demanded that the president do what he did with Keystone. A lot of people put a lot of pressure on the president, and he finally did the right thing, and that is to kill the Keystone pipeline, which, by the way, under a Trump may be reopened again. Uh, but that is what he should be doing. And certainly, the demand must go to the North Dakota authorities that the kind of military presence that exists there is simply not what is acceptable. So we have written to the president. We are going to continue to put pressure on the president uh, to do everything he, can, everything he can to protect the Native Americans in the area uh, and the protesters in the area. Let me ask you about that famous moment in one of the debates with Hillary Clinton where you said uh, you didn't care about the damn emails. <laughs> do you feel the same way today? I, what I said, and sometimes it got taken out of context, is, <laughs> is that there was an investigation going on, and that I wanted to spend that history 10 years from now, trust me, no one will remember these damn emails. <laughs> what they will worry about is people not having health care, they'll worry about climate change, they'll worry about poverty, they'll worry about infrastructure. And my point was, and the media often doesn't play that whole statement, I said, you know, I'm sick and tired of hearing about your damn emails because that's what the whole campaign is about. Why don't we talk about, A, the collapse of the middle class, income and wealth inequality, health care, education, how we move the country forward? And that was the thrust of my point. Uh, it is not my style, and I sometimes, amazingly enough, I get criticized for it, for running, you know, ugly and negative ads. I prefer to stay on the important issues uh, facing the American people. There are other areas we could have gone uh, as well that Trump went into that we chose not to do it. Because I think in my own state, I can tell you that people do want to hear a serious discussion on serious issues. That's what we tried to do. Well, let me tell you the reason I ask this now. This issue that was hijacked by the right-wing media and Trump himself, 
but the issue of the Secretary of State setting up this private email server, and she has her husband, who's the former president, and running a multi-billion dollar foundation, uh, meeting with heads of state as well, and yet they don't have accountability here. What this means, not only for them, but if this becomes a model, for example, for President Trump, he runs a vast business empire. Absolutely. He is a, the top government official. If he decides to set up his own private email server and decides that he can uh, disappear tens of thousands of email, there won't be a government uh, record of what is actually going on. Right. Right. I mean, I think that's a fair point. And I think with Trump, the major point is this guy has business enterprises all over the world. And you're looking just at immense, immense conflict of interest. Every decision that he makes is going to impact his bottom line and some business that he owns all over the world. So it remains a huge issue. And I got your point too, obviously. Um, you know, and that is the valid criticism of having a private email when you're doing government business. Mm -hmm. And now his cabinet appointments, your thoughts on the direction <laughs> he's going in. Well, I think this is where what our job is, in fact, um, as I mentioned to you earlier, I'm going to be, uh, I think, in Indiana on Monday night. Um, and we're going to go to the carrier plant uh, where you have a situation where a uh, carrier is, you'll remember, air conditioners, they make furnaces in Indiana, actually. And they decided, they announced last year they're going to shut down two plants in Indiana, throw 2,100 workers out on the street. This is a company that pays top dollar to its CEO's head guy, makes 14 million. A couple of years ago, they had a severance package for a former CEO. You know what the guy got as a golden parachute? $171 million. And now what they want to do is shut the plants down and move to Mexico and hire people in Monterey for three bucks an hour. So it becomes symbolic of a disastrous trade policy. Uh, and we're gonna be there. But to answer your question, what we have got to do now to those people who voted for Trump because they said, well, you know, this guy sounds reasonable. Trump sent out a tweet where he says, I am the only Republican candidate for president who will not cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, right? Well, believe me, every American, every person in this country, if I have anything to say about it, will know precisely what is going on with Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, because as you've indicated, they are beginning to appoint people who are typical right-wing Republicans who want to privatize or cut Social Security. And our job, and we've got it, we've got every statement that Trump made during this campaign. And we are going to hold him accountable. Every person in this country will know what he said and what he is doing. Trump said one of the issues that I think a whole lot of people are deeply concerned about is the high cost of medicine in this country. Trump said during the campaign he was going to take on the pharmaceutical industry. He was going to allow for Medicare to negotiate prices with the drug companies allow people to re-import medicine from Canada and other countries where the price is often half as much as it is in the United States. Well, you know what? We are going to remind the American people of precisely what Donald Trump said about that and many other issues. So now you have someone like Betsy DeVos um, chosen uh, to be the new Secretary of Education, sister of Eric Prince, who uh, you know, is Blackwater. founder of the mercenary for firm Blackwater. Um, and uh, a multi-billionaire, a multi-multi-billionaire, uh, I think, uh, very active uh, in politics in Michigan. And massive supporter of voucher system right. for education. Um, and then you have Mike Flynn, um, the National Security Advisor uh, nominee. And this goes to another point of, though it's critical to hold Trump accountable, starting with the Democrats. On the issue of the kill list, President Obama's kill list, um, his using uh, extra judicial powers, executive powers to kill people, can be Americans, um, without a judge, a jury, um, without them being charged with a crime. That's President Obama, and he's extending those powers. Um, your thoughts on President Obama's use of the kill list and then the idea of President Trump 
using his kill list? Well, look, uh, you know, when we talk, obviously I disagree with Obama uh, in using uh, unilaterally deciding who's going to live or die. And look, it goes without saying that, you know, we are concerned, I am deeply concerned about virtually everything that Trump is uh, talking about and has talked about in his campaign and the kind of people that he is appointing. But what's going through my mind right now is to figure out the most effective way that we can fight back. That's really what I am focusing on right now. And what I will say and what I believe to be the case, the Republicans are many things, but they're not dumb. And if millions of people begin to stand up and fight back, are they going to be thinking twice about doing very bad things? I'll give you just one example, Amy. Uh, a couple of years ago, sad to say, not only all, virtually all Republicans wanted to cut Social Security, there were a number of Democrats who did as well. And some of us in the Senate organizing a Defending Social Security Caucus, we work with senior groups all over this country, we've got millions of signatures on petitions coming in, and you know what? They backed off. They did not cut Social Security. So I think if there's, if there's a lesson to be learned right now, we are fighting for huge stakes. We're fighting for the future, future of the planet in terms of climate change. We're fighting for the future of American democracy. We have got to mobilize people and rethink our commitment in terms of what our role is in the political process. And the message I just want to make here in Philadelphia and across this country is it is not good enough to say, well, hey, I vote every two years, I vote every four years, that's fine, but that is not good enough. What we need to do is to be thinking every day the kinds of role we can play in educating and organizing and mobilizing people to defeat this horrific agenda. And I do believe that if millions of people do stand up and fight back, we can stop him from doing some really awful things. And that's what I'm trying to do right now, and we've got to mobilize people to do that. And we know we just have a few minutes, but um, this is an historic period. Uh, Fidel Castro just died on Friday at the age of 90. During the campaign, um, Hillary Clinton tried to red bait you by raising your support of the Sandinistas um, and talking about you being favorable towards Fidel Castro. But I was wondering if you could talk about the significance of the life and legacy of Fidel Castro and talk about the U.S. in relation to Latin America today. Well, it's not just Latin America. I, you know, I, I think um, what we can say, and I've been to Cuba two or three times. I think Jane and I went uh, in 1989 for the first time. I've been back a couple of times, and Jane had some educational work in Cuba. A lot of positive things that can be said. The healthcare system for a third world country is, is quite good. Uh, it's universal. All people have healthcare without any expense. Last time I was there, I visited a hospital where they do very, very serious and good work. They come up with a lot of uh, new drugs, actually, in Cuba, I believe. Their educational system is strong. Uh, but in truth, their economy is in pretty bad shape. And in truth, you don't do very well if you dissent in Cuba. So I think. You know, if you look over Castro's long life, he overthrew a terrible dictator, supported by the United States of America, uh, Batista. Uh, some very positive changes came about. We could argue to the cows come home to what degree American interference, you know, created the kind of society that exists in Cuba today. So I think you could say there are some positive things in Cuba, some very negative things. Uh, Fifty years after the revolution, people still can't uh, dissent with freedom. The economy is terrible. Uh, but I think it raises the question. I was on a Sunday show yesterday, and uh, somebody was raising a quote that I made about Castro 30 years ago. Uh, and, um, you know, it's somehow they've decided that Fidel Castro is the only, that Cuba is the only non democratic country in the world. So Saudi Arabia is fine, uh, many other countries in the Middle East are fine. And what we need to do as a nation is really start educating the American people. You know, Amy, I'm sure, that in 1954, way back when, we overthrew a democratically elected government in Guatemala, was unleashed decades and decades and decades of horror in that country, supported terrible people in El Salvador. Uh, we engineered the overthrow of Salvador Allende in Chile. 
democratically elected. The first time a person democratically elected in Chile was overthrown uh, through the uh, United States and the CIA. But those issues somehow don't quite make it onto ABC. But I think it is important to understand our role in the world in Iran. We overthrew, what was it, 1954, Mr. Mosaddegh? 1953. 53, uh, Mr. Mosaddegh. Uh, and uh, how many people are familiar with that? People know that? Good. Not a lot of people. Certainly young people don't know that. But in 1953, at the bequest of British oil companies, uh, the United States government helped engineer a coup of a guy who was democratically elected, <laughs> who was thinking about nationalizing some of the oil industry there. He was replaced by the Shah, who turned out to be a very brutal, brutal man, which then resulted in what we have uh, today with Khomeini coming to power. But these are issues that virtually, do, correct me if I'm wrong, have you seen many shows about that on NBC? <laughs> You know, it's just not something to be talked about. Tune into Democracy Now! It's All right. a good show. <laughs> Your thoughts that Donald Trump said that he would have won the, um, the popular vote, uh, but uh, for the millions of people who voted illegally. I know this will shock you. I personally do not believe every single thing that Donald Trump says. Uh, no, but I did mention in my remarks that that was a, da you know, this is, a, we can go back and, and look at all of the totally absurd and uh, uh, non-factual statements that, that Trump made. You know, and I, I, I am not a, a, a guy in politics who really likes to attack viciously my opponents. It's, it's not my style. But I felt obliged during the campaign to say something that was just patently true. <laughs> and that is that uh, Trump is a pathological liar. Uh, and, you know, I mean, he was saying, and, and the danger is, it, it may be, you know, everybody lies. You know you're lying. But I fear very much that he may be not even knowing that he lies, that he believes that he saw. The only person in the world who saw in New Jersey Muslims on a rooftop <laughs> celebrating the destruction of the Twin Towers. The only person in America who saw it. And he's utterly convinced that he saw it. And he may well be convinced of that. It may not be a lie. He may believe that he saw that. But this statement, as I mentioned earlier, the danger of this statement, it's not just that it is delusional and incorrect, is that it sets, if you have a president who believes that millions of people voted illegally, you're telling every Republican official in this country to suppress the vote, to make it harder for people to vote whether they are immigrants, whether they are people of color, whether they are poor people, young people, or old people. That is the danger of that statement. And that's something we have got to fight uh, tooth and nail. Will you be running for president again? Uh, <laughs> now you sound. Yeah. So now. She waited till the end of the program to sound like a mainstream media person. Well, will I, do I continue to sound? Do I continue to sound that way if I ask you? Uh, would you ever consider leaving the Democratic Party that you are actually not a part of? Um, uh, and well, well, let me answer yeah, the question. It is four years is a long time. I've got to. You know, I'm going to be running for re-election most likely in two years from Vermont uh, to the Senate. And there's just an enormous amount of political work that has to be done. At this, at this moment, uh, I think, um, you know, as now having been recently appointed uh, a member of the Democratic leadership, my job, with the help of everybody in this room, look, we're going to ask a lot from you. And here's the bad news. We don't want just your money. <laughs> See, and one of the things that bothers me is, and I will take this on, is Democrats spend an enormous amount of time raising money. And I have, for those people who are kind enough to donate, and we appreciate it very much, I gotta ask you a favor. Do not take up so much time, and I mean this very seriously, time of the candidates. They, if I have anything to say about it, they're gonna be going to Kansas and Mississippi and Alabama, where they're not gonna be raising money. They're gonna be talking to working people. So we need financial support, but we don't have the time to spend an evening with 10 people. We need your financial help, but you have to allow 
serious people in politics to go out and start talking to working people so that we can transform the politics of this country. Is that a yes for 2020? <laughs> so no comment for 2020. Um, it's a statement that it is a statement that we have to worry, believe me, about 2017 and 2018. And again, let me repeat what I have said throughout the campaign, and I believe absolutely from the bottom of my heart. Politics is not about a person. We transformed this country not by electing some guy or woman to be president. We transformed this country when millions of people stand up and fight back. That will result in good leadership on top. So the goal right now is not to worry about who's going to be running in 2020 or 2080. The goal now is to mobilize millions of people around the progressive agenda. And finally, um, Many people are deeply concerned about the two-party duopoly. You yourself are an independent or a socialist. Would you ever consider the third-party run, well, like I, joining with the Green Party? You know, I did that. Uh, I, in Vermont, as uh, many know, uh, I defeated Democrats and Republicans to become mayor, defeated Democrats and Republicans to make it into the Congress. Recent years, Democrats have been more sympathetic. Uh, and I've been a member of the Democratic Caucus for 25 years. So right now, I would not have accepted the position of leadership if I was not serious about fundamentally reforming the Democratic Party. So that's where my head is right now. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Bernie, the last question is, I'm this famous This is your fourth last language. question. Um, for people who are feeling deeply discouraged right now, yes. what did you learn from your campaign this time good, around? Good question. Um, where you almost won. Let me just say this, and, and the feeling of this, I wouldn't use the word discouragement, the feeling of maybe frustration, depression, and all of which is valid. But here's what I hope that everybody remembers. Anybody who knows anything about American history, you know, think about what this country, and I don't mean to be ultra patriotic here, but think about the issues that we had to confront. Think about 120 years ago, there were children, children, kids 12, 10 years old, working in factories, losing their fingers. People fought back, they fought to create unions. Think about the women's movement. Think about the civil rights movement. Think about the gay rights movement. Think about the environmental movement. Think about all of the hurdles that those folks had to overcome. We were during the course of the campaign, Amy, I don't know if you know this. I didn't know it until last year. We were in Birmingham, Alabama. And all of you, you know, probably remember the horrific bombing that took place in Birmingham. Remember that where four children were killed? I did not know until I was at that church that that month, in Birmingham. Do you know how many bombings there were in that month? Testing you, Amy. 200? No. But there were a lot. <laughs> point being, what's the point? The point is, you know, I thought there was one terrible bombing. There were 13 bombings. That city was under siege by terrorists who did not want to see the Voting Rights Act passed. And people fought back. So where we are now is it a difficult moment. I don't want to minimize the difficulties facing us. But throughout history, serious people have fought back. That's where we are now, and that is exactly what we have to do. It is not acceptable, it really is not, for people to throw their hands up and say, oh, I'm depressed, I'm giving up. It's not about you. It's about the future of this planet. It's about your kids and your grandchildren. It is about American democracy. It is about some very fundamental issues. And nobody in this room or in this country has a right to say, I give up. On the other hand, you've got to jump in and start fighting. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, in an interview recorded live on November 28th at the Free Library in Philadelphia. Sanders' new book is called Our Revolution, 
If you'd like a copy of today's broadcast, you can go to democracynow.org. That does it for today's show. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Nermeen Sheikh, Carla Wills, Laura Gottesdiener, Dina Guzder, Sam Alkoff, Robbie Karen, Honey Masood, Charina Nadura, and Andre Lewis. Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Nagara, and Paul Huckabee are our engineers. Special thanks to Becca Staley, Julie Crosby, Anna Ozbeck, Erin Dooley, Miriam Barnard, Hugh Grant, David Prude, Ariel Boone. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.